Well, good morning, everyone, and once again, a warm welcome to our English worship this morning. Today, we are continuing in our look at the parables of Jesus, and in particular, we are concluding our study of Luke chapter 15. The last couple of times that I spoke, we examined the two earlier parables in this chapter, uh, starting off with the lost coin, the lost sheep, and today we're concluding with a look at the story of the prodigal son. If you remember the setting of this story, Jesus was talking with the people and his disciples, but his message was particularly addressed to the Jewish leaders, the rabbis, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. And it was in response to their attitude that he perceived. The attitude of, we are better, and these other people are inferior. And more specifically, the attitude they had towards some of the very lowest level people in the social class, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, these people who came to Jesus seeking light and truth, who were drawn to his message of love and hope. And the religious leaders, they were repelled, they were repulsed, they were upset that Jesus would actually associate with these people. They were angry that he did not keep them at arm's length, that he welcomed them warmly to his <coughs> meetings and uh, made every effort to reach out to these people. He took time to, to talk with them, to listen to them, and in these three parables, Jesus tried to open the eyes of these religious leaders to their arrogance and their indifference and their, their pride. Today, we're looking at the last of these three stories, the prodigal son. It is probably one of the most famous parables which Jesus told. And it is also one of the longest. <laughs> Many of the parables are just one or two verses. But this is actually quite a few verses, a rather a long narrative, where Jesus explained the situation and how the situation revolved and resolved. It's kind of a short story. And so this morning I'd like to uh, look at this parable piece by piece, looking at the beginning, the middle, and the conclusion, and talk about some of the meaning and some of the background behind the story that Jesus told, and finally look at some applications and lessons that we can learn and draw from this story for use in our own lives and in our own situations today. So first, I'd like to just read with you the first few lines of the passage, and if you'd like to read along, that's in Luke chapter 15, and beginning with verse 11. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So, he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. How many of you have lived in lived on a farm? Anyone here lived on a farm? Me. Okay. Uh, how about in a small town? Small towns. How many people have visited small towns? <laughs> Maybe relatives or on vacation. 
Small towns, exciting places, right? <laughs> exciting places. Life on the farm, lots of things to do, right? <laughs> no. Yeah, if you, uh, if you live on a farm, life is very routine. You get up very early in the morning, before sunrise often, milking the cows, making preparations, going out into the fields, watering before the sun comes up. Often you put in a very long, hard day. Maybe you have a break in the mid-morning. Uh, then work a few more hours till lunchtime. Maybe have 30 minutes or an hour off for lunch. Then work another four or five hours. Maybe then another break. Then evening chores. And finally, you get to go home and eat dinner. And then go to bed. <laughs> and the next day, it's the same thing. Not such an exciting life. Uh, if you live on a big farm out in the country, there may not be anybody else nearby. The nearest neighbor may be miles away. And, and even if you live in a farming community, like in Japan, you have some of these farming villages where the farms are fairly close together, maybe separated by a rice paddy or a field. Everybody's too tired. You finish work, most people, they just want to go home and rest and sleep. Not a lot of social interaction. Uh, maybe a few people get together at the local bar uh, and share some drinks or drink some tea in the evening. But most people, they just go home. And... If you live in a small town, even if you go to town, nothing is open. Most small towns, they close down, sundown, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock. You go and it's dark. Maybe a few neon signs here and there. Maybe, maybe a fast food shop, a convenience store. Not too much else. And it might be okay to visit a place like that. But even then, it's kind of boring. It's like, whoa, we're here for the day. Oh, tonight, what is there to do? <laughs> Nothing. Okay, let's go home and go back to the hotel and watch TV. <laughs> and so we have this, this young man who's grown up in this situation on a farm, and he's the, the younger son. And so, he's not going to inherit the property. His brother, his older brother, is going to inherit the farm. He will get a portion, uh, a small lot, a place where he can uh, build a house, and he'll be able to grow some crops, but most of the property, two-thirds of the property, will go to his brother. In ancient times, the older brother got a double portion. Two brothers, two-thirds to the older brother, one-third to the younger. And his prospects were not that great. And in addition, at that time and place, they were still on the patriarchal system. The oldest family member was the head of the family and of the clan. And any kind of dealing with other families or other groups fell to the oldest member. And so, if he stayed in this community, his town, he would always have to defer to his older brother. He would always be in his shadow. Now, how many of you have older brothers or sisters? Now, what was it like when you went to school? Often, people were comparing you. Oh, your, your older brother, he did this. Why can't you do that? I had a younger brother. <laughs> I have a younger brother. <laughs> Not have, I have a younger brother. But 
what people are always comparing. Uh, one day, while I was at university, I was in the library. And this girl walked up to me that I knew, but not really well. She had gone to a different high school than me. She went to the same high school that my younger brother went to. And she came up to me and she said, You look just like your brother. I said, No. <laughs> he looks like me. <laughs> I'm older. <laughs> but the point is, we are compared. And when you live in the same area, if you go to the same school, if you live in the same town, people are always going to be looking at you and comparing. You know, what is your brother doing? What is your sister doing? And how are you doing? Are you doing as well? Are you doing better? And really, it's a no-win situation. Because if you do better, that sometimes causes problems too. <laughs> you know? Sometimes the, the other brother is jealous, <laughs> or upset, or angry. And it can cause friction sometimes. Even if you're doing as well or better. And so this younger brother, looking at the lack of opportunities, looking at the boring life of a farm in the village, he, he had a dream to, to go somewhere and make a new life for himself. And so he went to his father, who was still alive and healthy, and running the family business, and said, Father... I want my inheritance. Now, I'm ready to leave. Give me my share. Now, his father had no obligation to honor this request. By custom, inheritance was not given until the death of the father. And it was a farm. Most of the assets were not in cash. They couldn't go down to the ATM and say, well, let's put in the cash guard and, you know, calculate our worth, all right, you know, here's your million yen, 10 million yen. The son was asking for a breakup of the family business. And so the father probably had to go out and sell or lease part of their land. He might have had to get rid of some of their livestock and some of their animals so that he could give his younger son his share of the inheritance. But the younger son didn't think about that. And he didn't care about that. He just wanted his money, and he wanted it now. And his father graciously gave him his inheritance and allowed him to leave with his blessing and with his prayers. Now, the young man, he wasn't a very clever guy. Sometimes I ask people when I'm teaching, oh, what would you do if you got a million dollars? If you got a million dollars, if you won the lottery, or you got an inheritance, what would you do with the money? And of course you hear a wide range of answers. Oh, you know, I would buy a new house, or I would buy a car, or I'd like to travel around the world. Very, very, very few people invest the money. <laughs> Most people want to spend it. Use it all. Have fun. And that's exactly what this young man did. He went to a far country. He didn't stay anywhere near his hometown. He didn't want to be anywhere close to his family. He wanted to go and make a name for himself. And so he left everything behind except his cash. And he went and he spent his money in wild living. 
Wine, women, and song is an expression we use in English. Partying, the high life. When you have lots of money, and not if you have lots of money, but if you spend lots of money, people come around. Oh, he's having a party. Let's go. <laughs> ah, oh, you want to eat dinner? Sure. It's on me. I'll pay. <coughs> and so he attracted people, so-called friends, who only were around him because of the money that he had. And after a while, what happened? What happens when you spend and don't work? You go broke, exactly. If you only spend money, you don't do any work, the money disappears. And this young man, he wasted. The word prodigal, it actually means wasteful. He wasted away his inheritance on things which were of no consequence and no importance. He didn't even buy anything of value. So when his money ran out, he had nothing. And to make matters worse, a famine struck. A natural catastrophe. And because of the famine, economic collapse. There were no jobs because of the famine, because of the droughts, no work as a farmer, which is what he knew. Businesses closed down, and he looked for jobs, but could find nothing. And finally, he left the city, he went out into the country, and he found a job with pigs. Let's uh, read on where we can find out more about that. Beginning with verse 14. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his belly or his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. He did find a work he did find work day labor no benefits no insurance a place to sleep but apparently not even things to eat because are very much to eat because as he was feeding the leftovers the scraps to the pigs he he wanted to take them for himself he was that desperate. He was that hungry. Now, the pig was an unclean animal. And the Jews were not even supposed to own pigs. If you remember the story of Jesus when he was visiting the other side of Galilee, and he rescued two men who were possessed by demons... Where did he send the demons? Do you remember? He sent them into a herd of pigs, a herd of swine. He allowed these demons to take over the pigs. The Jews were not supposed to even touch pigs or be anywhere in their area because they were un considered unclean. And so, to the Jew, to have to work with the pigs... And feeding the pigs, that was kind of the lowest level job you could imagine. It would make you untouchable to the other Jews in your community. And so he was reduced to this terrible state. <coughs> Let's continue reading. Verse 17. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? 
And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. Reduced to such a terrible situation with no money left, working with these dirty pigs, half starved, he finally was forced to stop and think about his life, his situation, where he was, what he was doing. And as he considered his situation, he realized how stupid and how foolish he had been. He thought, even my family servants, the slaves of our household, they have a better situation than I do. My father gives them a place to live. They have food to eat. He provides what they need. And he thought, I'm a fool. I, I will go back to my father and I will, I will ask for a place among the servants. I don't deserve to be a son anymore. My actions, I wasted the inheritance. I have nothing left. But I can work and I can serve and if my father will take me back, I will work as one of the servants, as one of the slaves. At least I'll have a place to stay. At least I'll have food to eat. You know, a lot of times we are like that too. We don't really stop and think about our situation until tragedy strikes. We don't consider how many blessings we have until those are taken away from us. We take all of these things for granted, whether it's food or shelter, clothes. We often just think, oh, that's the way it is. And it's only when those things are removed that we realize what we have lost and how little we valued those things and how we wasted the opportunities that we had to use and to take advantage of those things. And sometimes God allows these kinds of troubles to come in order for us to wake up. Sometimes we are too dead. We are too numb in our lifestyle to hear the still small voice. And so God has to shake us in order for us to stop and listen and to stop and realize where we are and what we are doing. <coughs> And so this young man repented of his foolishness and he turned his face towards home. Let's uh, take a look at the next part of the story. Continuing with verse 20. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. 
For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they begin to celebrate. The son headed home. And uh, as he got closer and closer, I'm sure he began to feel apprehensive. <laughs> we don't know how much time passed between the time that he left and the time that he returned. We don't know if it was one or two seasons, several years, even a decade. The Bible gives no indication of how much time had gone by. And yet, he, he was a little bit worried, I'm sure, because he realized the, the enormity, the magnitude, how great his sin had been. He had wasted a third of his family's wealth. And he was coming back with nothing. And yet, his father was waiting for him. And uh, he ran out to meet him. To me, it indicates the father have been waiting. Day after day. Hoping his son would return. And so when the son came, he was overjoyed. And he ran out he hugged him, he kissed him, and he ordered him to be clothed. His clothes were dirty and worn from his work and his travel. But his father didn't say, okay, take a bath. <laughs> take a bath, clean up, and then we'll talk. He didn't do that. He accepted him just as he was. And he covered him with the finest robe, just as he was. Now, the son had lost everything. He had spent everything. And even the rain that showed who he was in ancient times, rings were used as identification. They had a seal or a, some sort of signet on them, which you would use for documents, just like in Japan you use hanko to stamp and to seal things. In ancient times, a ring was used for that. It showed who you were. It was proof of identification. It was used to sometimes as a token you might give a ring to somebody else, and that would be proof that you had spoken to them when you showed that ring to another person. But in his destitute condition, he had gotten rid of everything, even his ring of identification. And so his father said, give him another ring. show that he is one of our family. And he ordered a feast, a fattened calf. Usually this animal was kept for a special occasion. Uh, in Western countries we talk about fattening up a turkey or a goose for Christmas or Thanksgiving. But in biblical times, it was a calf. 
an expensive farm animal saved for special occasion to celebrate some great deed or some happy event. And his father ordered that this animal be killed to celebrate the return of his son. And so everybody was celebrating. And of course, the symbolism here is God the Father welcoming back the sinner who is repentant. Joy in heaven when the sinner repents and comes home. It would be wonderful if the story would end right here. A happy ending. It'd be a great story. But unfortunately, there is a postscript. There is a final part to the story, which actually carry a message and a warning. Let's take a look at the last verses of our story. Beginning with verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, What was going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you, and never disobeyed your orders. Yet, you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered away your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad. Because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The older brother, the good son, the obedient, faithful, devoted son. He never went away. He always did what the father asked or commanded. He never questioned. He performed his duties carefully and wisely. And he was out working in the fields. He put in his day of work. He came home tired, exhausted, ready to relax. And as he drew near, he heard music and happy laughter. Naturally, he was wondering, what is going on? And why was I not invited? And so, he asked some of the servants, What's happening? They told him, Oh, your, your younger brother's home. We're having a feast. Your father is overjoyed. And the older brother, he was not happy at all. In fact, he was angry and irritated. 
And he refused to go in to the party. He refused to join the feast. And so his father went out. He left the feast, which he was hosting. He left his guests, his family, his servants. And he went out to try to speak with his older son. And the older son did nothing but complain. Why? Why are you celebrating this idiot? He wasted a third of our family fortune on foolish living, wine, women, song. You are, and you're celebrating now that he's back. How can you be so dumb? How can you, how can you treat him in this way? I've been here all of this time, slaving, working hard, building up and expanding the family business, replacing the one third that that idiot wasted. You never once did anything for me, not even a goat. And the father said, we have to celebrate because what is lost is found. What was dead is alive again. And there the story ends. The older brother was a symbol. It was a symbol for these Jewish Pharisees and priests. It was a symbol of those people who looked down on those who were seeking repentance, for those who were seeking the truth, for those who were trying to find salvation. The older brother did not see salvation. He only remembered what the younger brother was before. He did not care about his change of heart. He had him labeled as a loser. And he wanted nothing to do with him. That was how the Pharisees viewed these tax collectors, the prostitutes, these foreigners who came to inquire of Jesus and to find the truth. They had no desire to associate with them. They refused to, to go in with them. They were angry with Jesus because He did. They failed to see the value that these people have as individuals. They failed to see that these people were changing and trying to change and were going to be different from what they were before. And the father, as he explained to the older brother, Jesus explained to these listeners, they were dead and now they are alive. They were lost and now they are found. And we should rejoice that they are with us again. Today, there are still many who share the attitudes of the Pharisees. They look at those seeking the truth, and instead of focusing on their search, they focused on outward appearances. Oh, he's... He looks different. His uh, hair is too long. <laughs> or his clothes are not nice. She, she dresses badly. He had a terrible past. Or she did some terrible thing. And, and I remember what they did before.
The Bible tells us that we will be judged by how we judge other people. If we are not willing to forgive others for their transgressions, God is not going to forgive us for ours. In fact, that's part of the Lord's Prayer, right? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, right? Jesus tried to teach this principle even in the prayer that He taught His disciples. As we are willing to forgive, God is willing to forgive us. It's a beautiful story with a powerful message. And it is my prayer that we will have the attitude and reflect the love of God the Father as the Father did in the story. And not have the stony heart and the cold views of the older brother. <coughs>